My name's Sasha P, and I'm joined here by Carson V. Hetty, best-selling author of Birth of a Salesman series, consistently ranked in the top 20 sales gurus in the world, ranked in the top 50 sales authors on LinkedIn, over 330 social followers, a top Microsoft social seller, number one, number one of nine leadership and sales roles across four companies, including Microsoft, AT&T. He's a seven-time CEO, Gold Club, President's Club winner. For those who carry the bag, we know what that means. He's a radio host, he's a podcast guest, he's a market of events. But what really excites me is that he's published a number of books. I've known Carson for over a decade now. His first book was Birth of a Salesman. That hit in 2010. Salesman Against the World, 2014. Salesman Forever, 2016. And Salesman on Fire this year, 2020. Welcome, Carson V. Hetty. Sasha, thanks so much, my friend. It's good to talk to you and uh, excited to uh, have this conversation today. All right, cool. So um, we're on other sides of the world. So you're in? I am in uh, St. Louis in uh, the Midwest of the United States in Missouri. And so it's uh, the evening hour for me. And I know it's morning for you. So uh, I appreciate you uh, making time for me bright and early. Not a problem. I'm Melbourne born and bred. So the accent, so if you listen to the accent, it's a Western suburbs uh, Melbourne accent. So uh, there we go. So Australia and Midwest USA. So other other sides of the world. So Carson, tell me, you, you've carried a bag for a, a long time. What 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 really inspired you to write? That's a great question. Um, I I ran a um, a division for AT and T several years ago. So I've spent a lot of time both in selling and in leading teams and. Um, for a while, I led a division and I was part of a newsletter effort. I wrote uh, newsletter columns and a lot of them were about sales. Um, I've always wanted to write something, but I didn't really know what that looked like. Um, sales books, there's a lot of them out there. And I knew that I couldn't really compete in that ecosystem to do something better than what had been done unless I did something unique. Uh, so I tried to create more of a parable-esque uh, type of story and the rest is history. I, I basically crafted kind of a book inside a book, um, similar to like five dysfunctions of a team, uh, but in essence, it is a, a sales book written by the fictional author who is the protagonist of the story. Okay, and so what 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 what, is, what, is, what feedback have you got from people that have that have read the book and and. Yeah, it's it's been mostly positive. Um, you know, it's been quite a journey. I think what's what I talk about these days is mostly about brand and how important your personal brand is, uh, because you're your first and most important product. Um, so whether you're looking for a new role or whether you're growing in your career, you're always kind of looking for that what's your differentiating factor, what's your superpower? And that's frankly what my book has been for me in my career. Um, mm -hmm. I was laid off several years ago and uh, you know I can trace back uh, through my career journey where the book took me. I was noticed for another role because I had written a book, that's what made my resume stand out. And uh, because of that role, I was recruited into another organization where I was ultimately re recruited into Microsoft. And I've been here six and a half years. So I have that book to thank for much of my career journey and the relationships that I've made all over the world, this relationship included, um, you know, being able to connect with people through uh, LinkedIn groups and um, just different thought leaders. Um, I've met Jeffrey Gittimer, Jeb Blunt, you know, some other luminaries of sales because of it, uh, being on their podcasts. So the feedback to the book has been good, um, you know, and then the subsequent ones, I, I got the first one published the old fashioned way, uh, which took a lot of uh, hard work uh, to get done and to get noticed. But um, then over the years, you know, I've self pubbed a couple of times. And um, so it's been an interesting journey, a lot of learning. Feedback has been good. And it's uh, opened up the doors to a lot of um, really valuable relationships. Mm. So I mean, you've you've uh, you've not only carried a bag, but you've you've run a, a a bunch of sales teams. And and from my own experience, you really un tend to understand something when you can explain it. And th there's when you when you go to the effort of writing your thoughts 
down on paper and have you know many many iterations of those thoughts You're, you've obviously gone to a lot of effort to you know to cultivate those ideas and so they can be shared so you can teach so you actually it's a learning process within itself so um, you understand it because you're able to teach it so walk me through how that plays in, when, when you're when you're writing a book or leading a team w what does that mean Sure, and and I think it's it's interesting to point out too. I didn't I didn't really have an intention to write some of the subsequent books that I did. I'm a very diligent journaler. Um, I think journaling is extremely important in your career, whatever you do. Um, and the reason I think that is because um, it, it allows you to capture learnings in the moment, uh, to go back through, look at some of the things that you've achieved. I mean, I leverage those even when I'm working on appraisals or uh, trying to capture uh, progress that I've made uh, on different pieces of my career or just the role that I'm in. So uh, being very intentional about journaling, um, I, I try to write a lot and I encourage people as well to contribute content. I think some folks hold back and they're afraid to uh, put themselves out on social media. Um, and I've had hits and misses over the last decade. I've created uh, videos and articles and blogs and some does nothing and others get tens of thousands of hits. It's just it's it's the consistency and, you know, journaling your progress, sharing your learnings, because that knowledge is what makes you valuable. Um, it's also that experience that um, is going to continue to define your trajectory. I've learned so much over the last decade, a lot of times by uh, deals that I've lost or, um, you know, just experiences that I've had with different uh, individuals or organizations and the ability to accumulate those experiences and that acumen and to parlay that into future successes. Um, that's really what it's all about. Uh, so mm -hmm. I think that's why I've tried to capture those moments in time. Uh, I might write an article about a uh, a victory or a, a frankly a loss or a lesson um, and I put that out there because others may benefit and fortunately it started a lot of really intriguing conversations um, but that's what I think the value is of those pieces and I I would just encourage people to find the time make the time uh, to journal and at least capture um, you know the lessons that you're learning along the way mm -hmm. So maybe we can uh, sort of drill down, like go down a rabbit hole uh, about content creation for, for, for a second. Like different people say that you should post a different amounts of time on, on social. Let's, let's just use LinkedIn as an example. I'm a once a day kind of guy, right? So I'll try and it, it, only for the, for the last um, month or so, I, I've tried to be consistent every day just to say one thing. I notice you on social, you, you might post two, three, four times a day. So walk me through your process. Is there, is there a right number for, for salespeople that are watching this about creating content and then posting it on a, on a social? Yeah, and, and here's the thing. I don't pretend to be an expert on some of those types of things as my process continues to evolve. Um, you know, I've I've had moment, you know, times where I was a one a day or even a one a week kind of poster. And then in recent years, you know, I've tinkered with posting more, um, but it lessens the engagement and the impact if you're posting too frequently. So actually, in recent times, I mean, I've I tried to pull back to be a little bit more relevant and also to tinker with different types of mediums. And what I mean by that is, you know, maybe one day uh, to your point, Sasha, you'll post something around, um, you know, text and you'll you'll ask a question or pose uh, something provocative. Maybe another day it's a video, it's a shared video content. Maybe another day it's an article that you wrote um, and it could also be third party articles. Sure. There's, you know, these platforms have different algorithms um, that have obviously also evolved over time. Uh, it's very mm. different than if you uh, wrote a LinkedIn article years ago. I mean, it would go straight out to everybody. You know, everybody in your feed, they saw that you know, Sasha created an article and then they'd get that notification. You get a lot of hits. Now it doesn't work the same way. Mm. Um, so it's, it's imp and it's also important to understand the um, value of hashtags, of, of tagging other people and with your content yeah. and your posts. Uh, but I think it really depends too. 
with LinkedIn, you know, I've typically seen posting maybe once or twice a day um, versus like a Twitter where you may post a, you know, half dozen times a day, uh, very different approaches. But um, those things are ever evolving. And that's why I would encourage people to do uh, some research, but also be don't be afraid to uh, to tinker and see what kind of results you get. I think I think that's a that's a really good point. It's the idea of experimenting, right? We're all learning. This is this is this is an ever changing landscape. And anyone who says that they know what, what where north is pointed, you know where the where the gold are, where the gold is in them hills probably doesn't know, right? We're all we're all trying to work our way through this. Um, so yeah, great point. Uh, so what advice do you have for young people who want to enter sales? Be a sponge be humble soak up as much as you possibly can there's a real value in knowing what you don't know and it was fascinating for me as i've transitioned throughout my career you know i've been in uh, phone sales inbound outbound i've been in tele telecom i've been in wireless i've been in uh advertising and now in technology and you know no matter what your vertical is or what your discipline is I think it's really important to make sure that you gravitate toward people that are doing well and that are doing what you want to do. And that's both as a peer, uh, but also as leaders. Um, you know, you want to gravitate toward, um, you know, frankly, mentors or other leaders in the business that can help tutor you and lead you down the path or set forth some of the milestones that you're going to want to hit in your career to get uh, your career goals achieved. Um, you know, when I was in my younger days and I was leading a division at a relatively young age, um, I had a very different worldview. I thought I, uh, I thought I knew a lot more than I did. And it wasn't until I was much older and, and actually joined Microsoft, surrounded by so many brilliant people, that I realized mm. just how... Um, just how much of a cog in the wheel or, you know, to use a basketball term, a, I felt like a sixth man. You know, I was there. I was just hoping to contribute. And uh, I knew that I had some good good things that I could bring to the table. So I think, again, talking about what we talked about before, I encourage you to find your superpower and figure out what you're good at, what you think you bring to the table. Leverage that tool, but be a sponge and soak up as much you, as you can from the other folks that are doing things that you do very well. Um, I always tried to pick up different best practices from different people. If somebody was saying this on the call, well, I can do that. I can say that. I can assimilate that and make it part of my process. And no matter what your role is, and especially if you're starting out, that should be your goal. Figure out what other people are doing and what they're doing well, and then how can you make that a part of your process? And, yeah. and frankly, everything in sales centers on people, and process. It's all about relationships. It's all about making sure that you put your your customer and your company at the heart of everything you're doing. Obviously, taking into consideration how you get paid. Um, I like to I call that the the sales trinity: the customer, the company, and you. All three have to benefit from everything that you're doing, but you want to make the customer really at the heart of your endeavor. Process is also very important. I mean, you can have the right people doing a process, but if it's not evolving and if it's not adapting, you know, specifically in light of the pandemic that we're in, um, if you don't change your process, given market influencing factors and variables, uh, you're obviously not going to be successful. So it's the right people following the right process uh, with the customer at the heart of everything that you do. And I think the quicker you learn that and you look to add value for everyone that you touch in the sales food chain, customers, colleagues, leaders, if you try to add value to every relationship you're in, you'll be successful. Yeah, how true is that? So I'd like to sort of double click on, on, a, on a point that you made and echo, you know, I, the, my, some of my greatest learnings is the one percent about shadowing another rep and hearing the phraseology of, and they said something or they did something or they answered a customer. I think that is brilliant. You know, I, I, I wish I would have thought of that. And my greatest learnings have been with the, the people that I've worked with and said, OK, yeah, I really like how that managing director talked about our history. I'm going to copy that. So it's a really it's, you know, my process is about working out what 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 are the one percenters for me that will might add 
to my experimentation, we talked earlier about experimenting, but really looking at other people around you, and is, uh, is there something, because you can learn from everybody that you work with, is there something that they say or do, or their mannerisms, or their phraseology, or their customer engagement, whatever, and then incorporating that into your work day. So thank you very much for that. That's really, really important. Um, so we, you touched on uh, the changing nature of sales, right? So we've, we've both carried a bag for a very long time, but um, you know, in the last, you know, 2020 has been a shift. You know, I think every every rep that I speak to on the phone, right? 2020 is different to 2019, right? So the way we engage with customers, how we picked up the phone, how we had meetings, our pipeline, you know, I worked in I worked in an organization where the pipeline just fell out of the sky the minute the minute um, the minute uh, COVID hit and 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 literally it cost me my jobs. But the the what would you say that you've found this this changing nature of of what's happened in 2020 and how are you adapting? Yeah, it's uh, it's a great question and it's one that we obviously all as as sellers have to face is this um, this new way of selling and and frankly um there's a, there's a lot of aspects that just become of amplified importance like creation of relationships and maintaining relationships and keeping customers at the heart of what you're doing um i remember early on in the pandemic you know obviously as as you mentioned i mean there's a lot of things that that might have been in flight that that stalled or were all together you know became obsolete um, you know, from not only, you know, people that I've talked to, but also just um, I, obviously I've talked to a lot of sellers as do you. And so I think that was kind of the norm is that it, it caused a substantial shift in just about everything that was in flight. Um, and I think what really became more important was the, the relationship. And, um, you know, I remember early on I was uh, leveraging and, you know, again, Obviously, I work for Microsoft and we now own LinkedIn, uh, but I do use that tool a lot. And uh, just being able to send like LinkedIn videos and, and voice messages to uh, people that I was connected with to check in, make sure they knew I was thinking about them, but it didn't compel them to uh, necessarily respond. It was just kind of a, a personal touch, finding ways to make personal touches, uh, checking on uh, the people that you're connected with, um, and making a concerted effort to be you know, a, a human uh, through all this was was more important then than probably ever before. The relationship was always important, but it kind of went up a notch. Um, and even now, there is there's this uh, you know there's there's obviously a lot going on in our world. I think um, never before in sales have I seen such a need to uh, to empathize and to really understand where people are, uh, to take into consideration some of the factors that have impacted the businesses that we're working with. You know, I've worked with small businesses over the years. I've worked with large organizations over the years. And I think there's a very intentional effort right now to make sure that we 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 really plug in and understand where they're coming from. Um, what are their new parameters? You know, what uh, how has their budget been impacted? How has their personnel been impacted? And then to add that human element to it. And and there's a patience. There, there's got to be a patience built in. Um, I'm very fortunate to work for an organization that um, has taken that into consideration for employees as well. But I know a lot of salespeople that have lost their jobs through this. And mm. um, so I think more than ever, it's and, and frankly, you know, I always I consider us to be uh, noble knights of the mm -hmm. selling profession. I think there's a, you know, I love the fact that I've seen a lot of people coming together and really proactively trying to help each other in the selling ecosystem. Um, but that relationship with the customer is still got to be at the heart um, of everything, even though it looks different. Um, mm -hmm. And a lot of meetings have switched to virtual. I'll tell you, if you are diligent and effective at prospecting, you're probably more likely now to get a meeting with some of these senior leaders than ever before because they're not commuting and they have a little bit, probably not a ton more, but they have a little bit more time and ability to have the bandwidth to at least have discussions. I think now is a great fertile time to be setting the foundation for relationships or 
amplifying some of the relationships that you have. Um, you know, as we all know, nothing lasts forever in business and sales. So I think now is a great time to really be cultivating or advancing some of the relationships that we have. And when budgets start opening back up, mm. in my mind, it's off to the races. So yes, sales has certainly shifted, but I think it's also opened up a lot more opportunity. Okay, cool. So you, you make many, many points in there. Um, but what I'd really like to, to really hone in on, if you had to say, because I've got a strong opinion of, of what, what, this me what this means, because I, I think I really like to echo your points of what you said about empathy and, and really trying to, to circle it, circle in. But the, the, we've all got a number to hit, right? Yeah. So you've got a quota, we've got a number to hit, and, and maybe you work in an organisation whereby there's patience on that number and it's okay to miss. Right, I don't know, um, but I would say most and most organisations have got an expectation that this is your quota, right? We, we might have revised it, but you know we still expect you to deliver, right? What what would you suggest is the number one key focus that reps really need to to uh, look in from the business side? That's really going to make sure that they can cut through. Yeah. No, it's a good question. And I'd love to get your thoughts on it too. But I personally, um, to get through to the business and to make sure that you're able to still achieve at a high level during a time like this, um, my philosophy has been all about, and, and we just talked a little bit about it, we kind of scratched the surface about the relationship. But I personally, I put a full court press on uh, trying to get discussions, trying to make new contacts in the business, trying mm -hmm. to, I don't want to use, I want to make sure I use the right word here because infiltrate sounds a little harsh, but make sure yeah. that I have connection points with multiple levels of the business. You know, yeah. historically, an organization like mine, we have a lot of relationships in IT and those relationships are very important. So they're always going to be the lifeblood of what we do because they're the guys who get things done, keep the lights on and uh, do yeah. the mechanics behind the scenes. But um, by really spreading your wings in an organization and having relationships in the C-suite or in yeah. some of the uh, data delivery and some of the services side of the business or looking at ways where we can really partner in new ways uh, that's what I think transforms the relationship. And like I, I work for Microsoft, we have a very robust partner ecosystem. Uh, a lot of our partners are customers of ours that just so happen we we might co-develop. Um, you know, we may uh, try to figure out ways to commercialize products or services that they have today. Um, I think more than ever, you've got to challenge the norm of what does it mean to do business between your organization and another organization? Are, are there ways to break down some of those silos? Uh, are there ways to develop more relationships so that you have a breadth of business instead of, you know, you may have one, five, hundreds of accounts, um, but the ability to really go deep in an account right now is better than in my eyes ever before uh, to be yeah. able to develop new relationships. And frankly, that's how you're going to get things done is by gaining allies at multiple levels of the business. Here, here, I, I couldn't echo that more. So, uh, it, it's, so it's become harder because we need to go wider in accounts. Um, and so for me, I think it comes down to something very, very simple, right? And it's viewing, viewing the account from the customer's viewpoint. And if you can view an account, your account from the customer's viewpoint, then everything then becomes simpler. So for me, I'm I also work in technology and cloud. So we, that we we both we both sell in similar markets and similar types of accounts. For me, I think that what's really really important, particularly in technology, with a, with the growing trend of what what data is doing, the pressures on an IT business is. How can every business right now is pressured commercially? Okay, so how can we drive efficiencies, reduce cost? Those things are even more pressing today than before. So if you can look at ways to deliver ex more value by driving um, cost down or uh, driving business of, uh, efficiencies up, 90% of, let's say, the IT spend is in BAU. 
right? And I have worked in those spaces. So the last role, I worked in a space where it was about innovation. Innovation now has just gone out the window, right? So all, 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 the, all the guys who were, were selling sort of bleeding edge technology right now I found that personally, though those projects are the ones that have stopped dead in their tracks. But a BAU, you know, the, the heartbeat of an organization, you know, you've got a you've got an ERP system, you've got, you know, a cash management system, you've got whatever that powers the business. If you can add ways to increase revenue, decrease costs, improve productivity, those ways, and you can, you know, it makes sense to to their world, people want you to come in. Right, but they want they want they want to speak to. So that's where I would uh, that's where I'm I'm spending my time, and I would echo the point about build, building real deep relationships across functional uh, and within the business. And so IT just becomes the enabler of that conversation. But you might want to speak to you know if it's manufacturing, you want to speak to the guys who run manufacturing, right? Um, so, and if, so it's speaking to the business as opposed to speaking to the, the procurer of the function. So it's, you know, I can't remember the last time I spoke to somebody in procurement. And so years ago, I'd spend a lot of my time with people who, you know, wanted contracts. You speak to the right person who, who gets the business done, they'll take care of procurement. And yeah, we, we don't need to worry about spending those hours of those legal documents. And remember the, all those markups that we used to do in 2019 and 2018? I, th that, that's almost sort of gone away because it's so imperative now to deliver business value because businesses are hurting now, right? Yeah. People are being, let's let's talk about reality. People are laying off staff. They're trying to drive efficiency, right? So really those things that we did in 2019, those markups, you know, sitting down with your lawyer and their lawyer to go through markups. I can't remember the last time I did one of those, right? It's, it's every facet has changed, but what yeah. is more profound is figuring out what is their new what is their new set of parameters? How can you best partner with them to collaborate, to do all the things you just said, Sasha? I mean, it comes down to, um, you know, optimizing operations, figuring out ways to cut costs, reduce redundancies in their business, um, you know, and that can impact every facet of their business, supply chain, um, you know, marketing. There's so many different implications that come out of that. And I think that's where we as sellers, we have to expand our mind right now to figure out what that could look like and make sure we're developing relationships with the right people. Yeah, very true. Okay. So, I mean, you, you've, you, like I said, you, you've been successful uh, throughout your, your, biz, your biz, business life um, and you worked with many other successful people. What would you say are the key characteristics that define success? Perseverance is uh, is a big one. Um, you know, I've had some some lost deals, some that would be debilitating over the years. Um, you know, and just and changes, unforeseen circumstances in career. You know, we all face different situations where maybe we have, um, you know, you're you're laid off or you. Uh, run into a manager that you just don't see eye to eye. Um, I think there's got to be an acceptance that nothing good or bad is going to last. And mm -hmm. your goal is to weather storms and to learn along the way, invest in self, um, you know, learn mm -hmm. training, um, you know, making relationships where you can learn from others, um, picking up these best practices. I mean, those are really the elements of success. I've been very fortunate because I've not only have I been successful as an individual contributor and as a sales manager, as a leader, as a director, um, but I've been a part of some really brilliant teams. I've constructed some brilliant teams and I've been, um, you know, just a, a part of uh, many of those. And I think whoever you're exposed to, you know, there's a responsibility on you to uh, get to know these folks, get to understand their motivations, what makes them tick. Don't be territorial. Uh, just because your name is on the book of business or the accounts doesn't mean you own them, you're renting them, and they might go to somebody else next year. You know, you could do the best you, you've got with what you've got at your, uh, at your disposal. Uh, but I think it's just be humble, be gracious, be very understanding, um, but persevere uh, through the, you know, the different ups and downs, because there's going to be a lot of them, some that you can control, 
some you mm-hmm. can't. And I think that's another interesting element as well. Control what you can. Um, mm. Because if you do, that's going to give you a built in confidence. You will feel um, if you're able to control what you can and dismiss a degree of what you cannot, it's going to make you a lot more comfortable and confident in what you know you have to do to get done. Focus on perseverance, focus on consistency. Um, You know, we were talking earlier about process. Um, You know, your process is going to change from time to time. It's going to have to evolve. But once you have a process that works, make sure that you're consistent in how you execute it and that you execute it. You know, I, I talk to people all the time about prospecting. And some, you know, they'll they'll go out and they'll try some of these methods and maybe they do it for a day or two, but then they stop and then they wonder, they look back a month or two down the road and they're like, well, I don't, I don't have any pipeline. I don't have anything going on. Well, that's because you stopped executing on that process. Um, so I think it's being very mindful of the process uh, that you need to execute upon and then being consistent in doing that. Um, and, and, and again, lastly, but very importantly, this is a theme of our conversation today, focusing on relationships. Um, I very much try to be diligent about, you know, reaching out to people that I work with, that I have worked with, customers, colleagues alike. And I say that because, you know, you never know. I mean, you and I have known each other for 10 years. You never know when you're going to interact with somebody next Um, And you've probably seen this too. I've worked in an environment where I may have worked with somebody years ago on a different project. Then they joined a different company and we worked together again. Then they joined Mm -hmm. another company or I did and we worked together again. And frankly, I've benefited from some of those scenarios. Sometimes it's, you know, might be a wash or it might be a detriment. Don't burn bridges. Uh, But I think it's very important to realize that, you know, this ecosystem is going to continue to evolve. So I think really being genuine and intentional and how you establish and keep meaningful relationships going, I think it's really important. You know, I was talking about in the pandemic. I mean, I sent a lot of outreach to people uh, back in March, April, just to see how they were and you know, just to say, hey, I, you know, I really hope and pray that your colleagues and your loved ones are safe and well. And, you know, if I can ever do anything for you, let me know. Um, trying to connect with people that have been out of work um, because I've been out of work and I've learned a lot in those types of situations, too. So I feel like I can help folks look for ways where you can help and add value. And I, th- mm. I really, truly think the rest will take care of itself. Yeah, so it's amazing when you give how the universe gives back. So you talked about two things that I want to touch on, but the first one is prospecting. Um, so early on in my career, I realized that the the telephone doesn't ring. So, you know, I, I've always played outhouse, right? Um, so I, I think I can count on my, uh, you know, I've been in sales 20 years. I think I can count on my hands. Somebody who said, Sasha, are you still at? insert company name, I've got a project for you, right? Yeah. I think I can, I think I can, it's saying that, you know, in the, the time that I've worked, I think I can count on my fingers where, where it's, it's been an actual, um, you know, where I've played in-house, right? I think, and some sales roles are completely in-house, like I call, I call that car sales, where, you know, somebody walks onto the lot, but we play outhouse, right? So we're going and we're reaching out to customers. So in, in, in my career, you know, the phone doesn't ring. Right, so it's all been outreach, um, whether it be soft or, or 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 cold. Talk to me about how you prospect and how you would recommend other people to prospect. Yeah, um, my 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 best advice there is differentiate. It's like the stock market; you differentiate your portfolio. You've got to be very cognizant that it's a probability game, and so mm. don't just lean on one thing. You want to have a variety of mechanisms at your disposal. I mean, we and, and also be very mindful of the time that you have to invest to do it. Um, what I mean by that is, you know, I've had reps over the years that they spent, you know, an hour uh, researching an account before they called on it, and then they call and they couldn't get a hold of anybody. Probably wasn't a good use of time. On the flip side, you also don't want to go in completely blind, not knowing anything about their industry, not knowing anything about who you're reaching out to. We live in a world where we have all this information at our disposal. I can see where somebody went to college. I can see uh, what hobbies they have. Um, So to be mindful of, hey, I want to have a conversation with this person. 
but also to be mindful of the amount of time that I want to invest in getting these discussions and the probability that I can get that meeting. That's what you really want to be cognizant of. You also want to realize, look, I'm not I'm not trying to sell anything right out of the gate. I'm trying to establish a relationship. Frankly, I'm just trying to get a conversation at this point and see if there's any ability to add value. Now, <clears throat> I know for anybody watching this, they're thinking to themselves, well, you work for Microsoft. It's probably pretty easy for you to get a meeting with somebody. Not always true, but on the flip side of that, I've also worked at small shops. You know, I worked at a small consultant firm a few years back, and that's where I really started leveraging some of these social tools. So um, I always talk about prioritizing the warmth of relationships. So your network is the warmest relationship there is. That's a strength. Um, that's something you always want to fall back on, whether you're looking for a job or you're trying to develop relationships. So if you see somebody that you know, knows somebody you want to talk to, that's the best viability that you have to get in front of that person. Now, the next thing is I, I, I like to set up a, a process, really a system. So I have my email alerts, right? So I'll have email alerts about a different organization or maybe it's a business journal. And so that way I can kind of see what's going on in the territory. That's alerted me of, you know, changes in the C-suite. So there's new people that I want to reach out to, uh, M&A activity. So if there's a merger, acquisition, uh, different types of compelling events uh, that I can reach out and offer a value or offer a service. So set up these email alerts, you know, your LinkedIn sales navigator, you can go in and set up your account list, you can monitor those types of things. And personally, I play a numbers game when I'm actually going out and doing cold outreach. So I, I do everything I can to see who my network knows. If there's a warm handoff that can transpire or an introduction, that's the best. Also, you know, we work in a very robust partner ecosystem. So um, I try to really build a team around myself um, of different people that also have a vested interest where maybe we can create a mutually beneficial relationship to try mm -hmm. to say, hey, we would both benefit if this relationship over here happens. How can we help each other make that happen? So that's yeah. another value add. But then finally, if I'm going after just blind, cold research, I'll go to LinkedIn, I'll go to Sales Navigator, and I have leveraged messaging that I've changed countless times in the last 10 years, uh, but I will send that out to people very intentionally. You know, I'll set up my search parameters. I go after, you know, maybe it's a C-suite, maybe it's a VP, a director level, um, but I'm, I'm very intentional in how I send this messaging. And I try to send it to many people that I think would be a good relationship to have. And then I send the connection request and I probably have about a 40% or higher probability of getting that meeting based on the verbiage that I use. And then after that, I'll reach out again, thank them for the connection and try to get a meeting. And, yeah. you know, just like anything, it isn't you're not trying to sell anything. And it's also no. like if you're looking if you're looking for a job, you're not asking for a job. You're asking for a meeting. You want mm. guidance. You want advice. And so often when I'm trying to meet with a with a potential prospect, I'm looking for how can I add value in this relationship? Now, with Microsoft, yeah. that's easy because they probably invest with us today. So yeah. personally, I'd like to make sure that they are privy to the resources that they're entitled to or that they know some of the ways that we are operating in their industry. And I'd like to you know, have them be a source of truth. Keep me honest on, is this a good way to support your industry? If I'm a consultant and I'm at a consultant firm, uh, I may go a different route and focus on some of the strengths of that firm, uh, some of the areas of aptitude that we have, and just say, hey, I, I'm really interested in finding more about um, this or that that maybe that organization is doing. Maybe there's a, a particular offering that they have, because really you're looking to bolster value there. You're looking to say, hey, um, you know, I feel like as a consultant group, we can bolster value in how you position your key product or key initiative. So I think that's where I would focus, Sasha, is focus on the heat, the warmth of the relationship, leverage your network, leverage the information overload that we have at our disposal to do some research, but then focus on the numbers game uh, when you have to go cold and develop new relationships. There's so many tools at our disposal. I use LinkedIn and it has really helped me to get in the door, have conversations, and then also stay top of mind. They can see what I post. And that's also a very passive way of selling. I send newsletters. Um, I put together events, build a community around what you're doing and mm. people will take interest.
Yeah, fantastic. Uh, so one one thing uh, I'd like to, to sort of echo what you, what you said, people who have a process and continue to follow that process on outreach, however you want to call it, the touching base with prospective customers are more successful. Right. The amount of the amount of the amount of reps, uh, colleagues that um, that I work with and who choose not to do that, then at the end of the year, why they're on where they are on the leaderboard, it's sort of there's a there's some co- correlation, right? So activity will you know get busy and and stuff happens. Um, if you can then get busy and focus that in the right direction, then you're probably more likely to 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 improve that. So and you, and you said one important thing for for those of of us who who uh, run teams, and I'd like to get your thought on on running teams because so, sort of shift gears for, for those uh, people who are watching this who have a have a, a, a team team based function they, they carry a, a, what I call a bigger bag. Um, what are the key things that you're looking for when you're looking to run a team and? What makes a successful team successful? Yeah. Oh, man. Great question. Because teams are so different. Um, And I've seen a lot of managers that have tried to take a cookie cutter approach to how they manage people on their team. Um, I've also seen folks that have tried to coach out, um, you know, lower performers or, um, you know, just manage in a way that almost eliminates what they deem as their weak link. Um, and personally, I, I think the the most important thing you can do as a leader is to understand your team and how mm-hmm. they tick. Um, I've been really fortunate. I've been, you know, a leader of teams. I've inherited teams. I've, um, you know, had a lot of different team iterations that have worked for me over the years. And what I always try to do is make sure I understand um, how they operate, what matters to them. Um, You know, maybe they want to go places. Maybe they want to get promoted. Maybe they just want to put food on the table. Uh, But whatever it is, I can help them do that. It's my job to remove barriers to their success, remove obstacles, um, give them a roadmap to do whatever they claim they want to do. So you want to get promoted? Great. Um, But there's a lot of folks, too, that you may manage that they have a great few months and then they think they're ready to get promoted. You also have to ground their expectations and make sure they understand how the game is played. Um, Cause I think there is a, there, there's a value in having real polish and discipline and how you conduct yourself in the business sense. So understand your people, understand what makes them tick, remove barriers, empower them to be successful and really truly work with them and make sure that they understand that they're part of the solution and the way forward and be transparent. Um, I can say that, you know, the transparent leaders that I've had over my career, I've worked so hard for them because I actually felt like I was trusted Mm -hmm. and I felt like I was a part of the process. I felt like I was a part of this magnificent system that was moving forward. I understood it. I plugged in. And I saw the value that I could bring uh, to that um, to that endeavor. Um, you know, it, it's there's more that you cannot control when you're a leader because you obviously can't control the work ethic and the um, the effort that people put into uh, their daily regimen. Uh, you can't control sometimes that people show up to work. And right now, when a lot of people are working remotely. You probably have less control than you've ever had. So there has to be that degree of trust. However, if you do a good job of evangelizing your business and why you're on this journey together, I truly believe if you get the buy-in of the people that work for you and they understand that you support them, you've got their back, you're going to help them get where they want to get, wherever that is, they're going to go far for you. You know, I'm a self-motivated person. I don't need anybody to, you know, dangle carrots or tell me like, hey, you do this, I'll do that for you. I don't need that. I'll get up on my own. I am, you know, I'm always going to be there and I'm going to be as diligent as humanly possible. However, there's a lot of folks that don't necessarily have that, but they could. And so Mm -hmm. it's important for leaders to understand the potential that exists and to be able to find the right ways to get their buy-in. How do they want to be led? Probably one of my favorite stories ever as a manager was there was a team that years ago, uh, it was going to be shut down. Um, And it was a team that called on existing customers 
and you know basically went through their service offerings what they had and then attempted to upsell and this team was going to be shut down they were doing about 70 percent to goal every month well uh before they were shut down i offered i said hey I'll, I'll i'll take this team let me see what i can do with them and uh you know i went in and, and frankly a lot of times when you get a new boss one of the first things you think is man this here's the new person they're going to come in they're going to change everything and they're going to you know bark orders I did nothing of the sort. I sat with every one of these reps. I understood their process the way they saw it. I asked them, you know, what are best practices? How can we turn this ship around? I asked them what's not working. And I sat them all in a room after I had sat with them for almost a month and basically just said, hey, this is what we are, you know, we're going to collectively work through what changes are going to transpire. And so for the better part of that first month, we really formulated what's the right strategy going forward. And we collectively made the decisions of what was going to change. The first month, we hit 140% to goal after we made those changes. And so obviously that team still exists to this day. And that was a decade ago. So I think what that illustrates is how important it is for everybody to be along for the ride. Yeah. I'm not better than or above anyone else. It's mm -hmm. my job to make sure that I orchestrate and put into harmony all of the different skills and personalities that are on my team, that I understand yeah. what's your superpower, what's my yeah. superpower, what's his, hers, Let's figure out how we make these work together. How do we share best practices collectively? And, you know, I got to tell you, Sasha, I've had teams of 5, 10, 40 people that worked around over the years. And every one of them has been vastly successful because of the people, but also that willingness and the ability and the desire to really, truly work together, understand each other, what motivates each other, and just be transparent and be people. And sometimes, don't get me wrong, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, somebody isn't a fit, and we've got to make sure that they find their, their calling is not this role. With you. But yeah. it never surprises them, and it's always a conversation that we can have because we respect and trust each other. So, yeah, profound. Um, I think you've hit it, the, the nail on the head. Um, so this conversation has been amazing. Um, I really appreciate it. All the, I mean, we, we've we've taken a, a forty thousand uh, foot view on many of these topics, uh, but hopefully um, the sales people and sales leaders that are that are watching this, even customers, that we actually care about our interaction in the process of helping our customers. It's 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 actually not about uh, the, the the best sellers out there. It's not about the sale. It's really about. Um, adding value to the, to the to the customer changing their lives so um and our greatest pleasure is in the act of giving all right not in the act of getting um today's been an absolute pleasure it's no wonder why um i said in the intro uh, of who you are so thank you very much for taking this opportunity today to, to be speaking with me and then collectively speaking with everybody else who's going to watch this video uh, moving forward you have a Fantastic evening, sir, and until next we speak. It's my pleasure, my friend. Thank you for the opportunity. I really enjoyed our chat. And, um, you know, I think uh, as, as sellers, we have a big responsibility, and, and you hit the nail on the head. It's to continue to add value and to really show that we genuinely care about the result. Okay, until next time, my friend. Catch you later. Thank you, Sasha. Catch you.